Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Brian Kennedy, director of the Toledo Museum of Art. Brian has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Brian, for joining us today. Pleasure to be here with you. So the Toledo Museum of Art has an amazing collection, and it's in a historic area of the country in which art really has informed the history of Toledo. Talk about the collection of the Toledo Museum of Art. Well, the origins of the collection are in the decision of a man called Edward Drummond Libby to come from Massachusetts uh, to Toledo in 1888 and bring his glass company with him. He was looking for cheaper gas and cheaper sand and cheaper labor. And he also found uh, his wife, Florence Scott Libby, who was from a storied family in Toledo. And so together they built a glass company, the Libby Glass Company, but also the, the industry that ultimately named Toledo the Glass City, because many glass corporations are based in Toledo. And he decided to um, effectively elevate the city, that he would elevate his industrial work. It was a rather Victorian, Edwardian kind of theme at that stage. And one of the things that he, he planned to do was to design a, a museum for the city. And uh, he founded a museum in 1901 with some other luminaries. And then it was um, in two temporary premises. And then in 1912, uh, they opened a building which was really out to rival uh, the Albright Knox. It was to be bigger. And it was by Edward Green, the same architect. And it gradually got expanded. Uh, he died in 1925 and left his fortune. His wife continued the effort. And during the Great Depression, she had, I think, 2,000 workers working on the building. And so the building was expanded with wings and also with a peristyle concert hall, which is 1,750 seats. It's astonishing. And uh, so anyway, this is the, the origins of the museum. And the collection is quite extraordinary. One of the things that has always impressed me is that while today people talk about acquiring the one great object, that seemed to be the sensibility of this museum from its very inception. Right. And the first thing people say to me when you say, you're director in Toledo, we've got a great collection. And it was never intended to be encyclopedic. It was never even intended to be representative aside from the glass collection. And Corning has the encyclopedic collection, but Toledo has this collection of great, great individual pieces of glass. And so that permeated the entire institution that we'd have great individual works of art by artists known and unknown over time that collectively together would inspire people about creativity and imagination that humans are capable of, of achieving. And uh, today, I mean, everybody comes and says, my goodness, what a collection. And we're very uh, choosy, very judicious. Um, we deaccession works that do not meet our standard. Um, in a sense, the Kimball in America is the kind of bijou version of what we would be trying to do, the jewel box. Um, and ours is much larger. But the principles are essentially the same. Toledo is, is a city in transformation. It, it's right in the heart of the Rust Belt. Um, and that city is being transformed with uh, healthcare um, services firms and all sorts of different industries that are coming in. And throughout its history, the citizens of, of Toledo from all walks of life have been very much connected to this fabulous museum and the works coming in from, from uh, France, the Impressionist era, from all over the world, yet there is this, this very intimate connection between the people of Toledo and the, the art and the artists that are presented by the museum. Right. Well, I think that, I mean, people often say it's the most community-based museum in the country. And I mean, we get an extraordinary visitation. There's, I think, 260,000 people in the city, 600,000 in the metro. And last year, we had 450,000 visits. So there's quite a bit of repeat visitation in the community um, based museum, of course, but every museum has some repeat visitation. This is an extraordinary number, and it goes to this idea that visiting the museum is a completely natural thing to do. It's what you bring people to do when they visit. Everybody goes to the museum, because obviously it's something that people can capably show off and feel very proud of. The connection to artists and to making goes to the foundations of the museum, which is actually typical of museums in the Midwest, that they were established not just with the museum, but also with an art school but not a certified art school, an art school that was about educating the students of the, of the city. So there's hardly a person in Toledo who hasn't been to classes at the museum growing up. And even today, we've, that's a very, very extensive part of what we do. So this practice of creating and then seeing the products that has been made by people all over the world is what drives the museum. And very viscerally, of course, in the glass collection, because since 2006, we've had a separate building, the glass pavilion. And it has you know six glory holes. And 
they're operating 20. You have a hot shop. You, yeah, 24 hours I, a day, they're just. I have a piece that, that, that I sort of helped make. Good, good. <laughs> every day on on my desk. It's calling everybody to have your own inner artist as well, because it's not just you um, uh, seeing other people's work, it's actually you participating in the making of work. And you know, the, the adjunct was that uh, in 1992, that non-certified art school became the certified fine art school of the University of Toledo in the Frank Geary building that's next door to the museum. So all those students still come in. Why is it so important to, to your mission to, to focus on education? It always has been, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Libby traveled, um, and you know, they went to Egypt in 1906. They traveled um, broadly, and the idea was that you would inform yourself by the examples of, of others. It's a very interesting dynamic in American art museums uh, currently, whereby art education seems to be not as favored as a title, um, as, for example, engagement or interpretation, other kinds of words. That doesn't mean that everybody's not preoccupied with art education, but Toledo states that its purpose is art education. That's our purpose. You know, our mission is a broader statement, but our purpose is art education. It always has been because the idea was very much to do with, you know, the libraries of the time, the Carnegie libraries, was that if people were exposed to examples of great production, then they would aspire in their own lives to create better products, but not just in industry also in the way that they dress, in the way that their offices were sorted out, their homes, their gardens. And this was very much informing the beginnings of the museum where like teaching people about birding and about stamps and about how to lay out a garden, all these things we think are sort of new now. They were absolutely part of the curriculum. And so we've really, in recent years particularly, sought to retrieve so much of our history without ever having had an institutional written history, as many museums have. Because today, um, multi-sensory education and the ability to train our senses is as, is as important as ever, but within the education system it tends to be pushed to the margins. How do you determine what you're going to purchase? Because even with the funds that you have, those works that are so publicly embraced are so astronomically expensive that unless somebody is there to write a check for you, mm -hmm. they, they are even out of the reach of, uh, of a museum like the Toledo Museum of Art. You need to focus on excellence that perhaps is underappreciated. How do you find that sweet spot? Well, like historically, the museum has always sought to look uh, in counter trends and into areas that are less um, uh, expensive, and, and because you're not encyclopedic, and because you're not even trying to be representative except in the glass area, you can have the field of anything that's out there that ha achieves the quality standards that you think will allow it to sit within the collections um, without causing any bump or trough. You're not held hostage to a preconceived notion of what you must collect. Right. And um, so, you know, we're not making collections per se. We're, we're making a collection of, of objects. Now, not every museum is like that. Um, but it does give great liberty that there are contemporary artists today in America whose works can fetch tens of millions of dollars. And yet, just to give an example, I mean, the last great family portrait in private hands by Franz Hals, you know, one of the three great 17th century Dutch artists and the great portraitist who lived in Harlem, um, was capable of being acquired by us because though it was expensive, it was af achievable because right now people are not saying that Franz Hals is as important cost-wise as some contemporary artists. So, I mean, if you apply that principle, and that's a rather exaggerated version because it was very expensive nonetheless, but you apply that to the whole way of thinking about what's available in the history of art currently and in the past, you can buy wonderful things. Brian Kennedy, thank you so much for sharing with us the work of the Toledo Museum of Art, and thank you so much for your insights. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks for all you do.